This talk is about an original method for building geospatial applications of various types. The method is intended to help making any geospatial application we can possibly think of. That's the goal. It utilizes directly the bytecode of the hotspot virtual machine, which, as you might know, is an open source implementation of the Java virtual machine. The presentation is related to an article with the title The Bytecode Unification of Geospatial Computable Models. This introduction, however, is based on examples of practical implementation, which is not addressed by the article, but which makes it more relevant to a broader audience. The major engineering concept, also introduced in the paper, is called the geospatial managed object. It is a concept with which we have been experimenting for more than six years. So, we start with showing how you can use these managed objects, and then we relate the most important things, back to the theoretical paper. That outlines the structure of the talk. First we show some things, some of which might not make a perfect sense right away, and then we try to make more sense out of it. A geospatial managed object, or GMO, in short, is a piece of data and algorithms bundled together as a single entity, which is positioned in geographic space. In this geographic context, the GMOs can represent something or do certain computation. All GMOs are encoded in the form of the byte code, as described by the Java Virtual Machine specification. Therefore, one natural possibility to define a GMO is using the Java language. Here, we can see a minimalistic GMO definition. Every definition must inherit some key properties. In Java syntax this is expressed by the Sixtens MO. If we have a look at this MO class, we can see six parameters here, along with their default values. Every geospatial managed object, even our empty definition, inherits these parameters, and also other properties from this MO class. The first three parameters are the XYZ coordinates in the three-dimensional Cartesian system with the origin at the center of the Earth. It is the same Cartesian system used by Global Positioning System. The fourth parameter is a scale level, which is associated with the XYZ coordinates. For the last two parameters specify a start and end point of the time period in which the GMO exists. These six parameters are very important because they provide a geographic reference. Without such reference, it would be impossible to talk about anything geographic or geospatial at all. These parameters are also used for a six-dimensional geospatial index that creates order for GMOs and allows for rapid access to them. The six dimensions in this representation of the geographic space are three spatial dimensions, one spatial scale, one dimension for time, and one temporal scale dimension. The scale dimensions are a little bit less usual, but they help, in a sense, to mimic the first law of geography, which states that closer things are more related to each other than distant things. The scale dimensions facilitate accessing the GMOs not only through where they are in space and time, but also within which range, in space, and in time, are they relevant. Next I have a short program that can create a GMOs using our minimalistic definition. It creates one GMO here, sets its Z value to 6.3 thousand kilometers along the Earth rotational axis and the spatial scale to the level 38. Then a second GMO is created using the default values, and both are stored on the disk in an object database. Now I use the script to execute this example. The main message here is that every GMO represents at least a point, a point in the six-dimensional representation of geographic space. Perhaps even bigger practical impact and the use of the six-dimensional geographic space is the fact that GMOs handle data and functionality on the same common basis. We make another GMO definition to make clearer how functionality and data are managed together, how they both are truly atomic properties of any geospatial managed object. This definition uses Python language instead of Java language to demonstrate at the same time that GMOs are language agnostic. In principle, we just need a language that is supported by the virtual machine. The first three lines do exactly the same as the minimalistic Java definition. The difference is this method, called, quite symptomatically, manage. This method is actually also defined in the abstract MO class, 
meaning that every GMO definition has it, but by default it does nothing. By implementing this method, it is possible to include arbitrary computable features in your managed objects. I really mean arbitrary. Any that can be coded using the selected programming language. Here the functionality is trivial, it will just print out the geo-referencing information about the managed object. Again, a program is needed to create an instance of this Python definition and to add it to the same database as the first objects. It might look like this. These examples are available on the website, so you can download them and try them for yourself. I just run the example with the script. So, we had defined two types of GMOs, one that only contains the minimum geo-referencing data, and one that also have functionality. We have created GMOs using these two types and stored them in an object server. Right now, the server is running, and it is waiting for requests from any clients to serve the GMOs over network. What matters from the end user's perspective is a GMO client, which is a piece of software that allows to use and consume the managed objects. Also because of that, we made a web start tool, which I will start right now from this web page. It is a shell-like program, which allows an interactive work with all aspects of this GMO technology. Meaning that the definitions, creation, and storage of objects, as well, as accessing, viewing, and interactive handling of GMOs can be done from the shell. The nice thing about that is that everything from the definition to handling and analyzing GMO content can be done from a single, uniform environment using Scala language. Here we have a Scala script for getting our test GMOs from the server. You need to specify a server address and port. And you must also specify a standpoint in the geographic space from which you want to access the GMO content. This is a simplified form of the request, which uses geographic latitude, longitude, and height above WGS84 ellipsoid. The time is taken from the operating system, and all spatial and all temporal scales are included automatically in the actual request. I execute the script, and it reports that we have received three managed objects using two different definitions which is what we have created so far, so no surprise here. Except that it works. We can also see the list of the actual objects received from the server. Now, I can tell the client to select the first GMO from the list, and, if I do it, I get this report printed out. It might be familiar to you, because it is exactly the message we coded in Python. The thing to realize here is that the printing is performed by that GMO itself. If I select the second GMO, I will get nothing, because in our Java definition we did not include the functional method. By modifying the previous script you could request objects from any GMO server on the Internet. I know of one such server at Gryphonor.net. Having GMOs around this place. Now I get this. 165 managed objects using eight different GMO definitions. Selecting the first GMO gives me some graphical user interface about monitoring GPS positions. If I select randomly the 23rd object, I get another window about the energy consumption of the building. I just want to stress that GMOs are independent, computable units. It is necessary to realize that these graphical user interfaces are inseparable parts of the GMOs, which are basically a content previously unknown to this client. So, in any software that supports GMOs you would get the same windows. Using graphical user interfaces and lists of objects for a given location might be useful for location-based services, but GMOs also have a low-level visualization support through data types closely related to OpenGL. Additionally, the shell also contains a visualization component implemented by Runasgard from Norcard. So, we can proceed from this web page with another example and see the last list of GMOs in a geo-referenced three-dimensional scene. This example doesn't go directly to the target point, 
Instead, it changes perspective three times to demonstrate the visualization of the GMOs at different scales. First it takes a planetary perspective where we can see a textured globe. Then we get closer to the target using a map like view perspective. Then we get an oblique perspective on the city. All you can see here are the managed objects of different types. And finally we arrive at this predefined perspective where we got these light poles and manholes. Now we do not need to select the GMOs from the list. Here you can just click on these light poles or manholes to select them. The main message about these is that they are connected in a network of manholes and a network of light poles. So, when I move this light pole to east, the whole network gets updated, which demonstrates GMO's capacity to model networks. Other step in showing how GMOs can have dependencies on each other is ability to detect clashes. If I turn on the clash detection, it highlights the manhole and light pole that are in clash according to some modeled rule. If I select the manhole, I can see it is in clash with this light pole and I can resolve the clash too. Nearby to the side there is a small geospatial app that allows monitoring positions in geographic space, for example using GPS. I start the monitor. Now, this GMO has a web API, so you can just enter a URL address in your browser to interact with this GMO, for example, like this, and see the marked position in the visual scene. Having a web API also allows to demonstrate that GMOs can have web page user interface. This is a simple form that will set my position using the manage object. Here you can see the position that I have just reported through the web form. The implementation behind all these things is clearly more than a mere library for GMO definitions. So far, we saw how to store objects, request objects, and serve GMOs over IP networks. Therefore, the implementation provides a complete network service for geospatial applications. It provides a geospatial reference interface for IP networks, or Internet networks, if you like, which also gives the name to the technology, it is called Griffin. Griffin facilitates creation of new GMO software but it also allows to add GMO support to the existing software. In a project funded by Norwegian Research Council, we made GMOs work with three different software clients, including a classic OGIS client. The clients needed to implement the Gryphon API to handle the managed objects. That's about 20 methods, which is not an overwhelming amount. We had Virtual Globe Client, which is a web start application providing its own implementation of multi-resolution Virtual Globe. It is in many ways similar solution to Google Earth. The second application was Virtual Map. It is a proprietary application implemented using .NET technology. It is a 3D visualization component used by commercial software for civil engineering called NovaPoint. And the last client was GVSIC and open source GIS software. This was an interest in client to have because it could demonstrate how GMOs can work in both 3D and 2D visualization clients. We ended up with a specialized interactive city model and three different types of clients using a single GMO server. If we consider Gryphon Shell as a non-visual client, we have four software clients that have been working with the GMO technology. The clients constitute a platform, or if you want, an infrastructure, but the main point is of course the content, the GMO content, that can be used on top of it. Over years we have accumulated various types of GMO models, some being just a proof of concept, but some being more than that. There are GMOs dealing with two-way synchronization of models over the internet, with web interface, with clash detection, with plane. GIS data with representations of network features, with terrain data representation, with near real-time sensor data from vehicles, with point cloud representation of litter data, with animations, with entire city models, and so on, and so on. So, the diversity is big and growing, which inevitably led us to ask ourselves a question, what are the limitations of GMOs in terms of modeling?
what can be and what cannot be made in terms of geospatial managed objects. That brings us to the conceptual article The Bytecode Unification of Computable Geospatial Models.